Hello, everybody. My name is Dipankar Mukherjee, and I have the honor and privilege to work on the contemporary and traditional lands of the Dakota people and work and build community with the First Nation people in the Twin Cities. With their permission, of the elders and the young, the youth of the Dakota and the Ojibwe people who came to the Twin Cities, we begin this program. Uh, my name is Dipankar and I'm the artistic director of Pangea World Theatre. And today we're gonna to spend an, an hour hopefully, with Nobuko Miyamoto. Uh, Nobuko just uh, finished a, a, a brilliant, even to say Nobuko that you finished a class is a wrong coinage. You're like a river that flows and keeps flowing. So at, for this moment, Nobuko took a breath after doing a master class um, for our community uh, and all of you, many of you have joined in and some new people who are joining in now. Um, welcome, welcome, welcome on behalf of um, the staff, the board of directors and artists of art to action and Pangea World Theatre. I welcome each and every one of you um, to flow with this icon of theatre, my one of my mentors, one of my elders, um, for somebody whom I have such deep respect, Nobuko Miyamoto. Uh, Nobuko um, has been a part of uh, NIDEC, National Institute of Directing and Ensemble Creation um, for the past few years. Nobuko, we can say, is um, one of the uh, scaffolds, uh, the scaffolding of, um, of our envisioning uh, the space called National Institute of Directing and Ensemble Creation, which came to being because we saw, we wanted to create a space uh, for uh, directors of color and women directors. And uh, Nobuko has uh, done master classes. Nobuko has sat and listened. Nobuko has taught. Nobuko has been a witness. Um, Nobuko has guided us. Uh, Nobuko has encouraged us. Nobuko has affirmed us. Basically, we stand um, on the vision that Nobuko has helped us um, craft and create, and the journey is fiercely strong and going on. So Nobuko is artistic director of, of Great Leap Theater in LA. Like whatever, however you define Nobuko, welcome. <laughs> welcome, 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 welcome. Thank you, you uh, too kind. <laughs> uh, you know, every time I say something Nobuko is, this then I uh, that something at the back of my head says no because that and more <laughs> you know so, so every terminology uh, every sentence that has um, uh, just uh, a pause uh, uh, and Nobuko is and that more and more um, uh, so wonderful such an honor Nobuko thank you for that amazing class that you just did um, you have this ability to take people from all over the world and bring them together in the confluence of a sacred breath. And I watch you work and I watch your work and I learn. And so it's an honor uh, to be with you. Um, thank you for being with us. Well, you know, I, it's really my honor because through all these years of being a community artist, it's such a struggle. <laughs> I mean, you know what that is and it's, you know, now I'm, I'm, I'm at a different part of my journey and uh, maybe sort of the, the last part of my journey. And um, 
So I look at it differently, but I really... <laughs> this is just the beginning. <laughs> but the thing is, you know, the struggle has been so... Uh, it, just to be in this space and, and be appreciated, uh, maybe too much, because I feel like I've been stumbling and I wish I was a better artist. I wish I was had done more and could have done more. Um, and I look back... Um, on the reasons sometimes the blocks that have been put in front of our us so that we can't do as much as we really want to do, uh, which over time you sort of like, sort of expect that, you know, and you work around it. And really we, we people like us, and Gia and all of people of color who've had uh, community arts organizations know that in spite of the funding, in spite of what is around us, we have survived and we've tried to find a way to be relevant and to, to bring our work um, before, before and to be part of our, bring our community, to raise up our communities and to be recognized, to be seen, to be, uh, to re be, be accepted as part of, the, of, of this landscape of American culture. It, it's truly, um, so that's why it is rare to be in the space and that we have moved through time. I've been doing this now as a community artist for 50 years mm -hmm. and how we have, we have uh, grasped space. Uh, we don't have land, but we have space. We have mm -hmm. influence, we have a voice that we didn't have 50 years ago. And, um, and the Institute is important because we need more people uh, to be working the way we have. Um, and I didn't even know, you know what devised theater was. I just want to say, until I came into this group, I, I sort of figured it out uh, and created works with community people, but uh, I didn't know, it didn't have a name to me. It was a process that just sort of unfolded so it's nice to be in a space that actually gives it a name and, and honors that, that, that kind of work that doesn't come from a script from an individual person, but comes from the stories and the, and the abilities of, and the creativity of individual members of our community that may not call themselves artists and may not call themselves you know, uh, actors, but are truly actors in this bigger stage of, of, that we live in. Yes, absolutely. You know, these terminologies, uh, you know, when we go beyond the shores of the country in you know, where English is spoken or English isn't spoken and mother tongue and vernaculars are spoken, we all have different dramaturgies. Uh, you know, it is, uh, and, and that itself just suddenly makes, makes a conversation expansive. So Nobuka, I want to follow um, one of my elders, Tom LeBlanc, uh, who's a Dakota elder, and I had uh, the fortune of working with him. And one of the lines he always says is that when you meet a storm, when you are faced with a storm, like what our Asian American community is facing today, uh, and uh, you go right at the heart of it. And I know, uh, I was just listening to the words of the song that you just were playing, that I'm a samurai woman, like, no shit. <laughs> So, 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 uh, Nobuko, let's let's really begin at the very core of what's happening right now, you know, and what is happening right now. That unfortunately, incident, unfortunate incidents in the country, and what happened in Atlanta, it didn't begin um, um, this last week. It ha it has history. Um, so, I would love to um, get uh, get a chance to talk to you a little bit about the historicity and the connection because the scars are very old. So I would li uh, like to address, I know when in our conversations, uh, uh, we have been talking about it. So um, I think I would love to invite you uh, to, to share uh, what is present. It's interesting that last night I turned on the Bill Maher show, show because I, I like to hear, you know, it's a sort of a, a commentary on on uh, what people are thinking and supposedly progressive people uh, who have commentary about 
our culture and what happens in the world. And he went into this thing about, oh, this was a, this is not a sex, this is not a race a thing. This is a, this was a guy who was sick and sexually, you know, had this issue with the church and he just went on and, and I just felt myself burning, burning because he does not decide he does not get to decide whether this is a race crime. The sheriff does not get to decide whether this is a race crime. The FBI head does not get to decide that this is, who the cares what they think we decide. Yes. Because we have been living this for 150 years since we've been here. Yes. We are people who built the railroads. We're the first people, Chinese people were the first people they made laws against coming into this country. They, they eliminated them from the picture of the finishing of the railroads when they were the one that gave their lives and they had the knowledge how to use dynamite, how to do the, they did the dangerous work and they eliminated them totally. And I heard that even some were murdered to keep them, to erase them. So this is what I felt is that they tried to erase us just as they have from the very beginning. They tried to erase us, our history. They tried to erase our relevance. They tried to dismiss the fact that three Asian places were attacked. Would they do that? For, for a black church? Would they do that for a synagogue? I don't think so. But because we are the quiet Americans, we are the good Americans, we are the, the model minority who has made it in this society, they can do that. So I said, you don't get to decide. You don't get to decide that I sat on the table with my mother-in-law, Mimi, and I'll talk to her about her more. Uh, when she heard about George Floyd, when she, when she saw what happened in that church in Charleston, she got to decide if it was a racist act because she has lived through it. Yes. I'm sorry for being, you know, I can't, I can't be contained right now. Yeah. You'll never be. You've never been contained, Nobuko, uh, and this. Uh, some of us at times have lose the power of outrage, and I think um, and all the, the people, not just in Minneapolis after the, after Brother Floyd's murder, is all over the nation and all over the world have joined in, uh, yeah. it, it, and our voices are coming strong and powerful and very fierce. Yes, uh, no, like our narrative has. To be it's always been written by us, but it never gets central, centered, and 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 you know, and it it just it just we are not waiting anymore. You know right. this idea of this model minority. We have not crafted that image, like you said. Others have. The other thing is that we we're not included. Asian Americans are not included when they start talking about violence against black bra bodies and brown bodies. Uh, we have not been included in that in that statistic. <laughs> now we've earned a place in it. You know, um, this uh, this portal uh, in, in which we are zooming, and there are many things that are great about it, and we are connected. Sometimes it does not allow the space or we think it does not allow the space for something for the silent to remain what you what you have said what your words are what your work is you know needs to just be centered and we just need to listen and your work has gone on for as you said 50 plus years i've when i was doing research um, to prepare myself to do justice to this chance of getting to 
chat with you, a journey with you. Um, I have photographs of you in your 20s with a placard on the street. <laughs> <laughs> and I have photographs of you <laughs> after George, brother George Floyd's murder with a placard on the street. And that's, and, and I, have, um, I have seen that. Um, um, so, um, so I would like to uh, just, um, I know we are, uh, I would like to ask you, Nobuko, can, um, you know, you talked about the goddesses that are right around us when our narratives are not being centered we need to acknowledge, affirm, listen to the goddesses who are right uh, around us. Could you tell us to, um, a little bit of your journey of your, uh, of your mother, whom you, you said for your mother, art was her religion. <laughs> True. So uh, a little I bit could... of speak that what made Nobuko, and many things will further make Nobuko, but a beginning sharing of a little bit of your beginning. So uh, I'm a child of Japanese American relocation. I was two years old when uh, we were forcefully removed from Los Angeles, where I was born. Uh, my, yes, so that's my father, the tall one. My father's actually half Japanese, his mother, Lucy Harrison was a Mormon who married my grandfather, Harry Miyamoto, who worked on the railroad. She, I wanna to talk to her about her. I didn't talk about her before because my father had two, uh, a few other brothers and one set was a, tr a twin and they were all in the car together. This is in probably about 1914, 1915. And they were in their Model T uh, driving in, uh, in Idaho, in a very small town, Parker, Idaho, when a car came along and pushed them off the road. And one of the twins who was an infant was caught underneath the car and his head was crushed. My, my grandmother, who I never met, Lucy, she was also pinned, her hair was pinned under the, the car. They, they saved her, they brought her and they went to the hospital with a child. The child died. The next day they went back to the car in the ditch and it was torched. It was burnt. So this little newspaper article that I saw on ancestry.com said at the end of it, a very superstitious, uh, uh, suspicious circumstances. So even then they recognize that this Japanese man and this white woman was in a car and somebody didn't like that and they pushed them off the road. And they didn't go to jail. They were never found. My family never, I didn't find out about this story. I knew my, my father's brother was a twin, but I didn't know what happened to him because we didn't get to tell that story in 1914 or 15. These were years when these kind of things happened and people didn't have a chance to speak out about it because they were a small minority. So that anyway, that's the beginning uh, because this book that I, that I wrote about my story, uh, this memoir, I wrote for my family mainly because I wanted them to know these stories and um, and I discovered new stories by, by researching myself because uh, only through my mother did I really know about even my father's family because my father didn't tell me either. And it was my mother who, who sort of was this person who learned how to be a mother from her grandmother. Um, and so when we got out of, 
uh, Santa Anita racetrack. We were in a racetrack actually in California. That's where they put us first. And we slept in a horse stall with this, with the horse smell and the, and the dander still in there on a, and, and that's how we spent uh, maybe six or seven months, you know, until they built the, the permanent camps for, for us. But anyway, my father volunteered to harvest sugar beets in Montana. We went to Idaho where his family's was, and then we ended up in Utah finally when we were still not able to leave and to go back to our homes in, uh, uh, our, in Los Angeles, but we were still sort of floating around the country like in the, uh, as refugees in America. And, um, but my father who loved classical music was celebrating. We were finally out of this mess, at least temporarily. And he bought tickets for a concert of music. And uh, we got from the first time I was four years old, I heard a real live orchestra. And we were sitting in the balcony. And I remember as a child seeing this man with a stick, you know, Sir Thomas Beecham, uh, you know, with his wild hair and, and bringing this orchestra alive with this music that was more beautiful and more powerful than anything I'd ever seen or heard before. And at that moment, I just, my life, which was, I felt like, you know, I was a lost child. I was quiet. I was silent. I was scared. I was felt, I didn't know where I belonged. But at that moment, I felt I found my body. And, I, and this place of music became it became a place that I could be myself, that I could express something bigger than myself. And when I went home, I, I listened to my father's records and I was dancing around and my mother caught this. She says, aha. And she found a little dance school in this both podunk town, Ogden, Utah. And, and, and she put me in this dance school. And that was the beginning of, of, of an idea that I could actually have a place, a platform to stand on that I could move. I could, I could be seen. I could tell stories, even though they weren't my own stories, but I had the power to use my body to express something bigger than myself. She showed me pictures of ballerinas from Maria Tallchief, who is native American, Sono Osato, who is Japanese and Irish, Alicia Alonso, who's Cuban to show me examples of ballerinas who were non-white, who made it and gave me the idea, oh, I could do this. And so when we went back to Los Angeles and I started seriously at this age of seven, started studying dance, I knew I was gonna be a ballerina because my mother <laughs> had planned, because my mother knew that this was the one place woman could be queen, literally. She could be a swan. She could, she was lifted by men, you know. My mother wanted to be an artist. She, she could paint, she could sew, she could design clothing. She, she went to school to study at Otis Art Institute. And her father told her, no, you can't be an artist. No thing for a woman. My father said, no, you need to stay home and take care of the kids. She, she didn't have a chance to be what she wanted to be. So she helped me be an expression for her and my father. And that's what a lot of parents, especially immigrant parents, even though my parents were second generation, that's what they did for their children. They did allow them to be something that they couldn't be themselves. So that was really the beginning and, um, mm -hmm. And the beginning, um, you always talk about revisiting the beginning, and that's why in all your work, um, Nobuko, it's so, uh, first of all, it is so intersectional, and I want to want you to also talk about your work, not only intersectional genre, but also intersectional race, ethnicity, identities, um, a space where when you talk about solidarity, I mean, your personal work, um, uh, your family, um, your collaboration with, um, uh, with 
uh, the Latinx community, collaboration with the Black community, um, and, and it has spanned years of that strong confluence that you create. Um, and, and the work that you were doing at that particular time, um, uh, you, you talked about the, Im the, the, the images or the, or the stereotypes in which performers were cast at that time. So, so, you know, first of all, let me just say that my first wake up call about racism, besides being, <laughs> being who I was, and, and after pro post war, and when you were called a Jap, I just want to say this, in Boyle Heights, when we moved back from the war and somebody called me a Jap, you dirty Jap, I didn't know how to respond. And I went home and I told my mother and she says, don't stoop to that level. You just go on and be yourself, you know. But I, I wish I could have stood up, not stooped to his level, but stood up and, and shouted back at him something. I didn't know how to do that. And so that's one of the things about being here and now that young people have the right to do that and know they have the right to do that. And then anyway, so go, I'm gonna fast forward to I was 12. And I, and I got a scholarship at the American School of Dance, a really uh, high level uh, training conservatory. And when I was given a scholarship, I was told by Eugene Loring that in order to be a, make a living as a dancer, I had to be twice as good as anybody, everybody else. At 12 years old, I was told that. And he, pushed me to the front of the line. He made me take these classes, not only in ballet, but in modern dance in all different forms in, and, and, and pushed me really, really hard to, uh, so I had an elitist training. We had Merce Cunningham come on the summers and train us and choreography and, you know, all these, you know, first class uh, dance people. But when I got into, uh, show business and my first job, of course. I was playing um, in a movie called King and I, and uh, this was a film and a, and a show by Rodgers and Hammerstein in which a white woman <laughs> was telling a, the Thai king ab about democracy. Uh, and it was done actually in, for that time in that space, uh, Yul Brenner, who was not Asian, <laughs> who was who was more of it was Russian actually, but brought some kind of dignity to a male figure. I have to say that that brought some kind of power to a male figure because we never saw an Asian who was powerful until we saw the samurai, until we saw Japanese movies. You know, Kurosawa uh, gave us. Uh, you know, these powerful male images. Now the women, I will say that I've played a geisha, I played a prostitute, a Japanese prostitute, I played a spy. These are the roles that uh, were given people that look like me. So I actually had to cooperate to tell the stories that the Western mind wanted to tell the world about us by using my own body. And me and other Asians like me, actually, we knew that when we were in it. I mean, we would talk about, well, <laughs> how come, you know, there aren't stories about us out there? How come I'm playing this in, in Broadway, playing a prostitute across the street from Flower Drum Song, which I was in, was the world of Susie Wong. And they had all these, you know, well-endowed uh, Asian women showing legs and breasts and et cetera. Um, that's how they sold us. That's how they sold their shows by using our bodies, you know. And um, and I, I, actually, I had the aha moment when I was on the stage. I was nineteen at uh, in Flower Drum Song, and I was singing Chop Suey, Chop Suey, you know, doing some stupid, you know, thing. And I looked at this audience of blue-haired ladies on a matinee, and I went, "Oh my God." Why are they looking at us like this? And then I realized that we were ch chop suey. 
We were Chinese food for white people. We were there for their enjoyment, you know, for their entertainment. And I felt really uncomfortable. Yeah, I was in a Broadway show. Yeah, I had a, I had a good dance role in it, blah, but I felt uncomfortable. And I didn't know why. I didn't have a name for it. I didn't have uh, any politics. I'd been training as a dancer, you know, seriously. I didn't have an, I wasn't aware of the world outside me. But this was the beginning of 1960s. This was, this is the beginning of a moment when black people were rising up and saying, hey, I'm going to drink at that fountain. I'm going to sit at that table. Uh, and I, I, my job, I, I need to be paid for my job, you know, and we're, we're, we're standing up for their rights. And we were watching this. We were, we were listening and watching it and in a way keeping our distance because we didn't want to be treated like that. We didn't want to have this horse, the hose spray at us. We didn't want to have the dogs, but we knew it was wrong. And, yes. and, and we knew we were people of color, but we didn't know how to really, because even our own parents, and I, I'll speak of this, and a lot of Asians don't, don't speak of this, but in our own families, and we grew up in neighborhoods with black people. We grew up in neighborhoods with Latinos because uh, our worlds were segregated from white people. When we came back after the war, we weren't allowed to live in communities that were white. They only allowed us to buy homes or live in spaces that were with black people and Latinos. So that's how well, we knew. And it was a rich, actually, a rich culture that we were, we were part of. But we were limited to that. So uh, we got to know black people, you know. At the same time, my mother and my, our, my, her, her, her Buddhist sister said, no, but don't you play with the black boys. Yes. They didn't want us to hang out with black men. So <laughs> I knew that. And I always was trying to be a good Japanese daughter. But when I, in the 60s, in the late 60s, when I, when I did finally join the demonstrations against the war in Vietnam, and when I did finally meet Black Panthers and, and uh, started under, to understand that they knew about camps that we were in, they knew that those camps still existed. And they knew that someday they could be put in those camps for being political uh, protesters and, and, and organizers as black people. So there was a sort of camaraderie uh, that they accepted us as brothers and sisters. They understood that what we had gone through and um, because I, I want to say, I think it's important for us to say that as in the beginnings of the Asian American movement in the late 60s, we were in the third world strikes at San Francisco State and Berkeley. Asian Americans were there in solidarity and in comradeship with, with Blacks and Latinos right from the beginning, and that helped to define our movement. Uh, yeah, I like to tell the story that, you know, black people had black berets, uh, Latinos had, the, they had brown berets, and we had maroon berets because it looked better with our complexion, you know, but, you know, we, 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 we did in a way follow the trail that black people made for us to show how we can stand up for our rights. So we were very strongly influenced from the very beginning of our movement. And so today it's not a, a surprise that uh, we identify, we identify not just our al as allies standing on the side ready to help out. No, we identify with being a third world person in this country. Right. Yes, there are new immigrants that come to here with, that don't understand what, what we as Asian Americans who grew up here, there's a big difference because we didn't grow up in a majority culture. 
We grew up from the beginning of hearing, you're a minority, you're a minority, you're a minority. Uh, we grew up knowing that there were things that we couldn't do and that we had to strive really hard for because we were, were a minority and that we would never be a majority in this country. It was, it was like training, you're a minority, you're a minority, you know. So it limited our dreams, you know, our parents and, and uh, there was a ceiling, a bamboo ceiling, they call it, but there was, they didn't get the advancements that other people got. They didn't get a chance to get an education that other people got. And how did it, uh, you know, Nabuka, how did, um, uh, I mean, uh, this, this was the air you were breathing, this was the land on which you were walking. I mean, how did this impact, this reality, this truth impact, impacted, how did it impact your body, soul, and your art? How, because I know it did, and I, and I know your work, there is no distinction between where artistic life stops and your art begins. So how would you just share a little bit about how you brought that into your work? So, so yes, so to say we didn't have our own song. We had no music that represented what our story was. And, and in the beginning of the movement, for Asian Americans, I was happened to, I had already studied music. I had already heard Billie Holiday and Nina Simone. I had already noticed that, wow, black women really know how to express themselves. And, and, and when, when uh, it just so happened, that uh, in one of our groups in Asian Americans for Action in New York City, uh, a young brother, he, he played the guitar and could, had, he could sing and he, he was really good. And we were together in Chicago at this conference and we had just visited the Black Panthers. We had just met with Native Americans who were fighting for, for uh, housing for urban Indians in Chicago. And that night, he brought out his guitar and uh, started playing and we just stumbled into creating a song together. And when we sang it to our group, it, it hit us and it hit them that this was the first time they had seen an Asian Americans who, who were singing something that they created themselves. And that, at that place uh, in Chicago in 1970, in that summer, in that conference, a, a young girl, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a young girl in, that was staying in the hotel that we were, was murdered, a Japanese American, Evelyn Okubo, they, somebody slit their, her throat. And another sister, another Asian American sister went up to find her and she got her throat slit also. Evelyn, the first one died and the second one lived. And they said, that a black person had done this. But we know that we were in Chicago and we knew that Freda Hampton had just been murdered. And we knew that they didn't like that we hung out with black people and the Black Panthers and we, and we, and we knew that this was a threat against us. So this was actually the beginning of us seeing ourselves as warriors of the rainbow. That we were, we had heard this uh, story from native people that had given us this, 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 this story. And, and we felt that we were warriors of the rainbow, that the change was going to happen when people of many colors came together to create that change. We went on and it changed totally my conception of what it was to be an artist, to be a song maker, to, be a, to, to, to use art as a way of reaching people and changing people's minds. And it just totally shifted. Oh my God. And we weren't worried about making an album or we weren't worried about being, we, we performed for free anywhere. We, we slept on people's floors. We, we, you know, we, we moved around from one part of the country uh, to another. Uh, and we didn't worry about what, what, you know, people were going to take care of us in our community. And, and we were able to spread the word about what was going, we were like griots um, moving from one community to another to, to spread the word and to, to tell our stories between us and to encourage uh, a culture 
and there was a, a sort of a renaissance of, of Asian American culture in visual arts, in filmmaking, in book writing, et cetera. Our stories were starting to grow out of this activity that we were now, activism that we were now involved in. So that's where it really began. I wanted to say that because it's not, it's not, it's nothing new that Asian Americans were marching for George Floyd. We have been, we have been marching and we have been standing next to from Yuri Gochiyama to, you know, to the present moment. We have been, we have been part of this struggle. Yes, yes. And it, it, neither did the str struggle begin now, neither did the injustice, but the fact that what you, all, I, what you always say, the power lies in telling our own stories the way we want to tell it, and the power lies in uh, the fact that these women whom you identify as goddesses sustained. It is not about what they were exper experiencing. They were experiencing hell, but the fact that they sustained, and that's where the power lies, and that's the story which you always honor. Um, uh, Nobuko, uh, uh, can we share uh, uh, one of the goddesses of your life, your mother-in-law's photograph, and, and the video yes. that you have shared? Uh, I know that people okay. appreciate that. So I want to introduce you my mother-in-law, Mamie Kirkland. She lived to be 111. And the last 20 years of her life, she spent six months of the year uh, living with my husband and myself to escape the Buffalo winters. Look at her. This was her at 107 years old. This is when she found her voice, actually, because she had told the story to my husband about growing up in Mississippi and having to flee when she was seven because her father and his friend were threatened to be lynched. And she went, the family went and she, to St. Louis, and then the St. Louis riots broke out. They moved to Lansing, Ohio, and they burned a, a, a cross on their front lawn. She grew up as a frightened young woman. Finally, she, <clears throat> she married at the age of 15 <clears throat> and moved to Buffalo and lived a simple life, raised, she bore nine children. And, uh, but my husband always heard the story and somebody uh, several years ago <clears throat> sent him a website of the Equal Justice Initiative. And he went on this website and he put in Ellisville, Mississippi. This is where she was born. And immediately this newspaper article came up where this man, John Hartfield, was going to be lynched. And he ran into the bedroom and said, mother, is this my father's friend? And she says, yes, John Hartfield. So he knew, my husband knew that he had to take her back to Mississippi. He knew that he had to have her to tell her story. So we went back and we took her to Mississippi. Equal Justice Initiative came there and they interviewed her and we took us to the very spot where his friend, John Hartfield, was lynched before 10,000 people. And this town of 2000, which is still a very small town, Ellisville, Mississippi, was able to call out 10,000 people in 24 hours to witness this horrific event with their children. So this is, this is where this song came from. Uh, but also because we sat at the breakfast table many mornings and she saw what was going on in, 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 in Charlottesville and uh, Charleston, excuse me, and she saw what was going on with George Floyd and, and, uh, and, 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 and others who were being murdered. And she said the same thing's happening now that was happening when I was growing up. So that's what linked this all together. And um, I'd like to share a little bit of this video, Black Lives Matter, uh, with you. Thank you.
Thank you for sharing that. That that's a precious, precious video. And um, you know, uh, Nobuko, your I know there were times because of the te technology, um, the the sound and the body's movement of the mouth does not match. But that's metaphorical of your powerful voice. The voice reaches first, and then the body emerges, just like this, just like the sun. You know, first the rays come out, then we see the sunrise. Um, Oh. That, that, thank you for sharing that. Thanks. Uh, you know, we're so clear that when we talk about solidarity, the work of solidarity, we are standing on the work of a lot of elders like you who have done the work, um, struggled with the work, died with by doing the work, and and are have paved the way for this solidarity work to continue. Um, it was then, and I wish I, we could look at the mirror and say, well, it was then and now is different, but I like the juxtaposition of then and now, and you, there is no difference between um, George Floyd, uh, what happened to brother Floyd, Brianna Taylor, their names, Aubrey, and continue. So how um, uh, in, uh, can, we, can you share with us a little bit, Nobuko, as to the work, the solidarity work, the work that you're doing now in the place um, in the Buddhist temple where you create work with the community, you're a community builder, stitcher, uh, thinker, and you activate constantly. So can you talk a little bit about the work that you're doing with the community now? Well, you know, it, it's funny, coming out with this album after I'm, uh, when I'm 80 years old, <laughs> the Smithsonian, you know, asked me to do this album and it's because I'm not a touring artist. I'm, I don't have a band, you know, and all these songs come out of different activities I've done with community and ideas that have grown out of learning uh, that I do with community. So I've been very lucky because 
when I went back to Los Angeles after I was a troubadour in the Asian American movement, I landed in this Buddhist temple. Somebody took me to this Buddhist temple, which actually my aunt and uncle were a part of, and they offered me a space to teach dance. And I was like, you know, the people in the movement, they wanted a dance class. And I'm like, oh, you know, I don't want to teach. <laughs> But they had a beautiful social hall with a great floor. And I said, oh, that's a nice space, you know, and I started teaching and I learned how to teach dance. I mean, I to, to, to non dancers and what it really opened up a whole because you want, even though they're not trained in the same way I was trained from the age I was trained, I wanted them to understand what it felt. The camaraderie that it felt like. And I pushed them really hard in my dance class in those days. And they used to call me Novocaine instead of Novoco because that's what they needed after my class. And my class was a mixture of not only Asian Americans, but African Americans, because I was part of two communities. At that time, I mean, I just had, I, I, I was a single mother of a black child. And that's a whole other story. But anyway, so I had to figure out how to be a part of more than one community because I, I'm raising this black child who lost his father, who was a, who, who was, who was a, a soldier in the movement. And, um, and so I had to live in these two worlds. And I brought these worlds into this Buddhist temple, this Japanese Buddhist temple. And some people came in and saw these, you know, black and brown sweaty bodies, you know, saying like, this is our temple. What are these people doing? But Reverend Moss, the head of the temple, he would not, he, you know, you just do what you're going to do. And, and, and uh, we actually changed the culture in the temple so that they could accept people like us, you know. My, my son used to, you know, some of the elders would say, what are you doing here? thinking like he was a kid from the neighborhood. And he'd have to stand up for himself and say, I belong here. This is my mother. So we sort of had to, you know, live in this world of uh, where we're, we're still elbowing our way into change. Uh, they had to accept me and I tend to do a school called the Marcus Garvey School. <laughs> and, 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 uh, because I thought he should have black culture. But then when I picked him up from school, one kid looked at him and said, and looked at me and looked at him and looked at him, And he said, is that your mother? And Kamau again had to say, yes, that's my mother. And he had to defend the fact that here I was that didn't look like him. That was, I, you know. So we had to do this jostling and trying to feel, create a space where we felt comfortable being who we were. And so that's how I sort of, and, and being with Latino people in New York, in my neighborhood, in Puerto Ricans, uh, we were making music uh, with people who were performing Nueva Cancion uh, and really learned about uh, Latin music and how Latin music was a, was a cultural weapon in the struggle in Latin America. Um, so, so we were learning from each other. And so in this last eight years, I also met a young man, uh, Quetzal Flores, and a young woman who's, these are, these are people who are my son's age in their 40s, the early 40s, and, and took me under their wing in a way, and they showed me Fandango, a community forum where people circle a platform and create music together in community, not as professional musicians. This comes from Veracruz, Mexico, which is across from Cuba and incorporates African rhythms and sounds as well as Mexican and indigenous sounds. And I thought, oh my God, that's sort of like Obon, this Japanese uh, form that we dance in a circle to remember our ancestors, except we dance around the, they play the, around the, the platform and we dance around it. So we, we decided, let's write a song that brings these two cultures together. And Reverend Moss at my temple, we went to visit him and he set the, the uh, moral compass for us. He says, it can't be a fusion. 
it should be a collabor it should be a conversation. So that set the uh, the stake in the ground for this uh, uh, festival that we do for eight years now called Fan Fandango Obon Fandango Obon now come together, and it brings uh, blacks, African Americans, uh, uh, Mexican Americans, and Asian Americans and Muslim Americans together to share uh, the traditions that connect them to Mother Earth. And we found a way to connect us with each other because we all share in these uh, uh, participatory arts traditions. So it's very different than performing arts, you know, where we get on a stage and we perform towards somebody. In this case, we're in a circle where everyone can be seen where everyone has a place and everyone is participating. We don't want people to be looking. We want them to be dancing. We want them to be playing with us. And that's sort of a challenge, you know, because now, you know, we're observers of, of the arts. We, we don't, people don't feel that comfortable in participating. So we want to sort of demo, democratize the arts by doing this festival and inviting people to get on their feet. Uh, before we see, um, uh, I know we have a very beautiful clip about everything that you're talking about, the Fandango, the collaboration, community activation, um, and we'll end with that. Nobuko, I just wanted to ask you, what, what do you see as a hope for the future? What gives you hope? Well, what's kept me hoping <laughs> through these many years is really uh, working and being with many communities. Coming to Detroit because Grace Lee Boggs invited me to Detroit to work with urban gardeners, working with uh, uh, Club of Noodles, this Vietnamese group uh, who, who we created devised theater together, working with the Cambodian community um, these are the, and, and, and sort of being a bridge between now, I mean, I wasn't an elder when I started, <laughs> I was a youngster or a mid, 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 you know, the mid, my midlife, but feeling this confluence of, of generations, um, and how, uh, how new ideas keep coming into play. And, and being an artist, I know we don't take directions very well. We do things our own way. And that's right, you know, as things are changing in the world. Now we're using Zoom, you know. <laughs> we learn how to adapt to different th uh, technologies and, um, and we learn how to, 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 and I hope that we're learning how to connect with different generations as well as different cultures because that really strengthens our th these different stories that we all live with and that root us in community and we see how people have survived through them gives us a sense of hope our our four bearers went through very very hard times and they survived and they brought us here and, and we keep learning uh, and building upon those, those uh, efforts and sacrifices that they've made. They didn't, they maybe weren't political and they didn't call them the right names and they didn't acknowledge certain things that, that you know, it, but each generation, each, each year we're learning more, we're putting layers on top of that. And so connect, feeling connected to those layers, that's what gives me a sense of hope. That's what gives me uh, a vision of the future. Uh, yes, uh, yes, 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 uh, Nobuko. Um, uh, thank you for the work that you have already done and, and thank you for the work that you will do. And just know that we are in front of you, beside you, behind you, around you, 
Um, I just want to want you to know that we are so grateful. The field is grateful uh, on the foundation of spirituality on which you stand, uh, on the inclusive spirit that you have, the rigor and fire that you breathe and provoke us, and you push us forward all the time. Uh, I'm so 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 grateful for the work that you have done, and and we we must tell you that it stops here. Yes. This anti-Asian violence stops here because you and your colleagues and your collaborators have done the work, are doing the work, but we must look at your eyes and say it stops here. And we will stop this, this meaningless, senseless violence and, and these terminologies that don't define us, called minority and majority, these were never defined or the nomenclature was never created by us. So in hope for a new nomenclature, Nobuka, I want to thank you for your work. And I would like um, us to finish um, this, this amazing conversation that an opportunity to talk to you with the Fandango. So thank you. Uh, with thank the video you. that you have asked us to share. And thank you, uh, Andrea. Thank you, Mina. Thank you, Debonkar, and the team who, who, who holds us up and holds us together to be able to come to you, uh, Suzanne and everybody. Um, you give me hope. You give me hope. You give me the future right now. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you to the tech team. Thank you to everybody who is listening. Uh, to this amazing, amazing, powerful elder and a present future of our field. So here's the video for all of us to enjoy. In the circle of Fandango Bone, we remember we're all connected. We're part of Mother Earth. Once all our ancestors danced around a fire, but now the fire is dancing around us. Climate change is here. We're being divided by the flames of hate. The fire is dancing around us. Today, our cultural spaces are being threatened by gentrification. But this circle of bricks designed by Isamu Noguchi, he designed it for Obon. But we're using it as an intersection between all of our communities so we can remember, tell our stories, and build on our cultural practices. We're saying we're here, we're not disappearing. Butterfly, I'm not your picture. 
future bright I am a samurai woman Who holds up half the sky I have unbowed my head I have unbound my feet I have endured the heat I'm not afraid to my heart when I took a stride. I am your memory, stories of you and me, moment of breaking free, so you 